open up our Bibles to Psalm 65. If you've got a Bible, it'd be a great thing to have that open in front of you. If not, that'll be up on the screen. Beck's going to read to us from Psalm 65, and then Bern will be back to preach to us. Good morning, everyone. Today we're reading from Psalm 65. Praise awaits you, our God, in Zion. To our vows will be fulfilled, you who answer prayer. To you, all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds. God, our Saviour, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the Father's seas, who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The stream of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain, for so you have ordained it. You drenched its furrows and leveled its ridges. You softened it with showers and blessed its crops. You crowned the year with your bounty and your carts overflow with abundance. The grassland of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks, and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. Well, it's good to be able to preach uh, to my own congregation now, uh, this morning. Uh, look, uh, it's a great privilege to preach the gospel from Psalm 65, um, and as we begin to do that, how about I pray and ask God for his blessing on our time. Our great and holy and generous God, we pray that you would open your, our minds as we listen to your word this morning, open the ears of our hearts, and send us your spirit. Please make us eager to hear you and to know you this morning. We pray through Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. In his name, amen. Well, it's Christmas Day. I'm with my extended family. Uh, we are celebrating. My family has a time of carol singing, of family harmony, uh, of good times together every time we get together for Christmas. Imagine the scene. There's my mother's uh, bread rolls laid out for us for food, uh, hot slathered with butter, a huge glazed ham, smoked chicken, uh, salads of every kind, and some salads even with marshmallows, true American style, and home churned ice cream for dessert. Feasts are great. And in fact, the Bible says that time itself is heading toward one massive feast, a feast with God, the generous host. Imagine that spread. But that can be a bit surreal, can't it? Great feasts are rare for most of us. And maybe you're someone who's never known feasting or family harmony like that around a table. Maybe you never get invited anywhere. Well, if life is cold for you, then come with me this morning. Immerse yourself in someone else's tale. And I hope that by the end of it, it will become your tale too. Because here's the good news. God says that this feast is for everyone. He wants to give it to you. And there's an appetizer. You can dig in already now. We'll get there through Psalm 65 this morning that we read earlier. And we need to travel back in time to an idyllic feast in Palestine 3,000 years ago. It's time for Pentecost, the Jewish feast of harvest. And God has blessed your crop. You're in holiday mode. Uh, yesterday, you traveled for a day to get to Jerusalem. There was major traffic but nobody cared because there were no cars. You could actually talk to everybody along the way. You could catch up with old friends that you met last year. 
And walking along with your family was your holiday tithe from Leviticus chapter 23, verse 16. A lamb, a young bull, plus flour and other party food in your backpack. Proceeds of the recent harvest. And today you've arrived, and it's all spread out on the table in front of you. Extended family stands around. You feel with all your senses that God is good. Imagine the scene. Your host is about to open by reading Psalm 65. Everyone is quiet. Now you're in the vibe. Let me reread verses 9 to 13. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain, for so you have ordained it. You drench its furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. You crown the year with your bounty. and Your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks. The valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. Isn't it beautiful? See God's generosity here? What he wants to give us? So let us delight in God's generous provision. Let's delight in God's generous provision. The psalm has two halves. The second half is what we just read. This is what suggests the harvest setting. God's garden, ripe with fruit. You're supposed to think of a garden of Eden. Well, what are the inputs for this kind of a garden? Look down at verse 9. First input is care and water. Then enrichment, streams of water. And then seed, grain, and more water, and settling, more showers, and God's blessing. By the way, did you notice the water? It just doesn't stop. It just keeps coming. How many of you wake up on a rainy day with kind of a groan? If you're a city slicker like me, maybe that's what you do. But let's get some perspective here because in the Old Testament, rain is the litmus test of God's blessing. So listen to Deuteronomy 11, verse 11. It says this. But the land that you're crossing the Jordan, this is Israel, crossing the Jordan to take possession of, is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from heaven. It's a land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from beginning of the year to the end. If you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I'll send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rain, so that you may gather in your grain, your new wine, your olive oil, and I'll provide grass for the fields for your cattle, and you'll eat and be satisfied. Psalm 65 stuff. For Israel, if the garden is green then it's a direct sign that God is with them. Life is good, all is well, God is handling it. Now tell me, does your life need rain? Does your life need rain? Hold that thought, we'll come back to that in a minute. Next, what are the garden outputs? Verse 12. Well, Nature is so excited by God's blessing, it just can't help but animate. To give you some of the sense of this, I'll have to quote a more literal translation. The pastures, it says, literally drip their goodness. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout. Yes, they sing. They can't help it. And the centerpiece of this exquisite stanza is verse 11. Look at it. God does this. You crown the year with your bounty. Your carts overflow with abundance. Literally, it says, your wagon ruts drip with overflow. 
Folks, this is the same God that you and I serve today. He hasn't changed. The world is full of his bounty. My parents in New Zealand have a plum tree so prolific that half the crop falls to the ground unused every year. And they, they won't even fit in their freezer. In fact, they give plums to all their eight kids and we put them in our freezers and there's still plums left over. The same thing every year, abundance. That's the picture here. The annual feast, a tangible reminder that God's heart's desire is to give in abundance. When you eat such good foods, and let's face it, we have way more than they probably had, flavors, spices, meats, cheeses, top wines. When you eat such good foods, do you praise God for his generosity? And do you seek him in relationship? Because that's what this is really all about. It's about delighting in God's generous presence. God's generous presence. We did the second half of the psalm first to get the setting, but now look back at the first half of Psalm 65. Now you can break these verses down in several different ways, um, but like the second half, I'm going to break it down into concentric rings, like the rings of an onion on any decent burger. Verses 1 and verses 5 to 8 are kind of like the outer ring. Each ring shows an extra layer of closeness to relationship with God. Take a look with me. The outer ring is about praise, verse 1, praise and offerings to God. Because, verse 5b, he's their hope. Their strong creator, calmer of seas, even of nations. He does awesome signs, inspiring all nations with joy, praise. The next ring in, verses 2 to 3 and verse 5a, show that God answers prayer. You who hear prayer. And it says, by awesome deeds, you answer. What's more, he provides a way to approach him in prayer. Verse 2 says, you atone for our transgression. You see that, that idyllic feast that we imagined earlier? Well, the Israelites don't have that good of a feast very often, if ever. Because remember from Deuteronomy 11, God's presence and the blessing of rainfall and food was dependent on their obedience. And if you remember anything at all about the history of Israel, you'll remember that they didn't obey very often. As in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months. Actually, their relationship with God was almost always strained. He would bend over backward for them, give them salvation and victory, give them everything they wanted, answer their prayers with awesome deeds, and still they would just complain. There are people who complain about the good stuff. Uh, like people who say, hey, the brie cheese has mold on the outside, it's white. And God would throw up his hands and he'd say, cheese is mold. I have a, a friend, Robin, from France. And uh, Robin loves his strong cheese. He tells me actually that it's impossible for cheese to become too moldy. It just gets better and better in his opinion. Well, you decide whether that's true or not. But the point is that the Israelites, they constantly grumble that even when God was making it better and better, they're grumbling. And consequently, the relationship with God was never what you would exactly call close. So then how could they pray? Why would he hear them? It says, you answer prayer, verse 3. When sin overwhelms me, you forgave. Literally, it says you atone for transgressions. See, which of you has a spouse like that? When you yell at them and falsely accuse them and complain, and they, and they say to you, I'll tell you what, would you let me make dinner for you tonight? It just doesn't happen, does it? Not that way. If you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend like that, they're a keeper. 
The relationship, you see, is more important to God than what's than the wrong that they've done. The relationship is more important than the wrong that they've done. This is our kind of God. Psalm 65 says, When we sin against you, Lord, you atone for our transgression. He restores the relationship. So we have the outer ring, praise for God. The middle ring, God answers prayer. Now the inner ring, God provides a way to him. Because verses, verse 4, it's kind of the key verse again. In the center of the stanza, blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. The temple represents the presence of God. Oh, to be with you, the psalmist says. Oh, to be completely satisfied by the things of God and his holy generosity. A feast of deep, unstinting relationship. Do you really know this God? You understand the beauty of his truly magnanimous character? Or do you say to your colleague at work, pay back what you owe? ungenerously, unforgivingly, then your knowledge of this God is incomplete. And he calls you and me today to grow in this knowledge. Not knowledge about God, but knowledge of him that leads you to become like him. Don't you want to do this in response to God? Does his kindness overflow through you? May it do so more and more. So come with me. Taste him. Taste him and see. Because thirdly, you're included. You're included. We've seen the two halves of this delicious psalm. God's generous provision and his generous presence. But now we too can have a taste. Remember our question earlier. Does your life need rain? Does it seem barren, or is it dry? Nothing you do grows. Never mind Israel. How does the rain come to you? Let's look a little closer, because the first clue is that this psalm is not just about Israel. It's much bigger than that. Verse 2 says, all men will come to God in prayer to seek forgiveness of sin and atonement. In verse 8, those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe of God and praise from the going out of the morning and the evening. That's from the sunrise to the sunset, from the east to the west, everyone. Verse 5 is unexpected. Yes, God is the hope of the ends of the earth and of the furthest seas. But, but note that these are not neutral seas. Verse 7 equates the seas with the tumults of the people and God says he will still them to Israel the seas represent the chaotic the untamable depths but here this is precisely what God will tame we're not neutral people we're part of rebellious humanity yet God will bring peace between God and all humanity the sheer generosity of God's harvest is bigger than Israel. Remember, his wagons will overflow with produce. Even the ruts in the road will be full. Even they get filled up. Do you remember the Syrophoenician woman from Mark chapter 7? Remember that even though she was not one of God's children, she truly saw this generos generosity of God. She reminded Jesus that even the dogs under the table, meaning herself, eat the children's crumbs. The psalmist would say, even the ruts under the wagon are filled with his bounty. That's huge because, well, I'm not from Israel. And most of you aren't either. That's huge for us. This tells me that I, too, can be included and that you and I can receive this generosity of God that overflows throughout all the world. 
that gives me both comfort and joy and should give you comfort and joy also. But finally, how does this work? How does this blessing get to me? By what mechanism do you grab it? Well, we saw in verses 3 and 4, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near. Actually, the NIV helps us a little bit too much here. Um, the, the ESV is more literal. Uh, in this case, it says, blessed is the one you choose and bring near. And perhaps you thought this was about you in the first instance, that you're the one he chooses. But no, we're part of, remember, we're part of sinful humanity. We have no right to this. And the Bible makes it plain. There is only one way to God as your own dear Father. One way for sins to be atoned. One way to dwell in God's courts and be satisfied with his goodness. One holy temple where God dwells and may be approached through sacrifice. And this one way was revealed by God when Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. He is the one. He is the one atonement that God chooses. Uh, we must not make this psalm for us without him. To do so would be to miss out completely on grace. But in him, everything is ours. All you here today who are united to Jesus Christ, this is for you as you are in him. In him, you are the chosen. You are the blessed ones. He has atoned for your sin. You are the ones abundantly provided for and unstintingly loved through the one Jesus. God is drawing you to trust his goodness. That's for now. But what of eternity? Well, there even better. There we will never be separated from his goodness. In fact, that's what eternity is. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they know the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you send. His generous presence through Jesus Christ. But like me, you may often feel that the generous produce remains out of reach, up in the wagon, rather than laid out on this table in front of us as a feast. And that's a reality of living in rebellious humanity. But as hard as life might be right now, it can be faced already today in reliance on him, knowing him deeply. He has poured out his life for you. So even when you sin against him, yet again, he makes the dinner. In other words, will you trust him? His future promise is so proven, so sure, so trustworthy, so generous beyond every unsatisfying alternative that all else pales in comparison. Hang in there, folks. The promised feast is coming. And you know what? We're not the only ones anticipating that day. Jesus himself gave us a commitment, saying, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Matthew 26, 29. He gave us wine to remember him by. But he remembers us every day by abstaining, by not drinking. Next time you enjoy a good drop, remember that. He's waiting till you're there. He's preparing this feast for when everyone is ready. Do not doubt that he's eagerly awaiting that day, preparing that goblet to be shared together with you and with me. Imagine how big a table that will be, loaded with food. In the meantime, his presence, his spirit is already here in this room 
speaking to you from these words of Psalm 65, reassuring us, guaranteeing the final fulfillment of his promise. Will you be satisfied with his goodness, with his presence? But also to those of you today who do not yet know this generosity, Jesus says to you, in John chapter 10, verse 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Come to him. He calls out to you, Isaiah 55, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy, come and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. You can't get a better deal than that. Perhaps you already want this, but you just don't know how. Look, come and talk to one of us after the service. It's not complicated. It's a matter of believing Jesus enough to trust him and to submit to him. It's not complicated. But even if you already know Jesus, connect with him deeply. Gaze on his beautiful attributes and in doing so, feast with his people. Praise him, delight in him, find in him complete satisfaction. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. You are invited to dinner with the Almighty. Will you come? Let's pray together. Praise awaits you, our God in the church. To you we come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. Blessed are those you choose. Our hearts are filled here among your people. In your presence, we exult. In your promises, we are satisfied. Amen.